Bill is a longtime friend. I saw him grow up in Norman, and I had him as a student at the biological station, where he impressed me very much. And I also took him on a couple of expeditions, one to uh, the islands in the Gulf of California. So we've become sort of attached over the years and communicated with one another. Uh, I was very proud of him when he got a Rhodes Scholarship and went to, to England, but he switched from zoology to psychology and uh, good, he's done very well. <laughs> So you're pretty proud of him as a student? Pardon? You're very proud of him as your student? Oh, very much so. Uh, I had him in classes with the biological so, so when the chimps are hammering rocks together, and they break and they create the artifacts you're talking about, is there any evidence that they are intentionally striking in a certain way? In other words, are there stone nappers within the troops, or is it sort of accidental shattering? Dividing intentionality is not easy um, in, in any organism doing any activity. Um, I, I'm going to say that there is no convincing evidence that we have yet that, that, that such breakage is intentional. It, it is interesting, however, that some proportion of these shattered or splintered uh, lithic modifications do have some of the characteristics of all the one tools, like conchoidal fracture. But that may be entirely accidental. And so we have to be very careful of that. By the way, this, in case you haven't twigged to it, we, we now have a problem if we have an, a chimpanzee stone age, because that means it has to be distinguished from a human stone age. So now we have at least two parallel lines proceeding back in time, and someone's going to have to sort out what are the distinctive sig signatures of hominid lithics versus pungent lithics. That's sort of my question is how, if you find a uh, chimpanzee fossil tool three and a half million years old tomorrow, how will you know whether it's human or chimpanzee? Well, what Mercator did with the initial excavations was to get experts to do blind assessments based on known materials. And Experts who did not know which tools were which could make those distinctions. Um, that's part of the problem, but it's still not going to solve the logical problem, which is the same problem we'll have with the chimpanzee stone age as we have with the human stone age. I mean, even now, when there's more than one hominin present on a particular uh, landscape, and we find stone tools of any age, there still is an issue about which hominin made which tools. So that's a continuing logical problem until we invent a time machine. <laughs> yes? Um, with these potentially long-lasting stone tools, is there any sign that they keep them or trade them, share them, pass them on to the next generation, something like this? There are some tools that get used over considerable periods and get moved around, that is, get carried around. Um, I can't say over, over generations yet. Generation times are long in chimpanzees. But um, what tends to happen is that they get exhausted because they, they end up breaking up to the point where they're no longer useful. Then they're abandoned and new ones take their places. Um, let me just say, and I I'm, I'm really have to be careful because I'm not supposed to give away things, but it turns out that raw material is really important. And most of what the chimpanzees have available naturally is, is rubbish, to be honest. So the next obvious thing that <laughs> Along that line, um, is there any, and I, I call this because I got here late and I said this right at the beginning, um, is there any evidence that they select, you know, in other words, they just grab the nearest rock, or do, is there some selection process that, you know, this one looks harder than that one, or whatever? There's, when given a choice of different raw materials, um, they, they make choices that are non-random and that are appropriate to the task. That is, there are different nuts of differing hardnesses, and there are different appropriate raw materials to crack those nuts. That's actually a well-established finding. Um, in terms of optimizing, then there are, there are tools that are too small and tools that are too big. And um, that's not really that challenging to think that, that they end up getting the optimal, uh, making use of the optimal uh, size tool. 
it, it's when, um, and, and this is, I'll have to give credit to the Capuchin people because they're ahead of us on this. They've done some nifty work on giving artificial stones, which are tricky because of the same dimensions but differing weights and, and sort of controlling for some of the, uh, the variables involved with, with, uh, with, raw mater uh, with raw material selection and showing that the Capuchins are very uh, clever about this. If you give a hammer to chimpanzee, what we use, and then show the chimpanzee how to use it, would they pick up that? Or they prefer this or the natural tools? Um, chimpanzees, when given the opportunity to use human tools, <coughs> as zookeepers will tell you, um, are adept at that. Um, things like screwdrivers and other <laughs> such things that end up in the hands of apes sometimes lead to trouble. So I have, I have uh, no doubt that, that chimpanzees given hammers of the kind that we use, I mean, that is proper handles and, and, and metal heads, would do so. But all of the work I'm talking about is based on wild chimpanzees using natural raw materials. Well, I had a question. Um, in your opinion, um, in the last couple of years, they had some chimpanzees that were using spears mm -hmm. with the bush babies. Um, was that more of a cultural innovation in that group, or perhaps was it more of a learned, observed behavior from um, humans nearby? Um, that's my PhD student, Paco, and I'm very proud of that one, so I'm proud of him. Um, that technique of, of skewering bush babies in their tree holes during the day up in the trees is n nothing like what humans use. So they, they couldn't have picked that up from local humans. But, but that's a good point that you make because some of these tool use patterns do show convergence uh, with, with, what human, with, with what local human beings do. And that creates an issue about whether somewhere down the line apes learn from humans or humans learn from apes or they independently converge on the same solution. Yeah, Hi, I have a short question and then I have a little bit longer one. Um, the first one is how long is your archeological death in terms of time? Just four and a half thousand years so far. So okay. But so, that's only because we ran out of time. I right. mean, we're going to keep the, the, the charcoal layers are still there. Right. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. The other part, the other question that I have is with the problem that we have with the Pliocene record for apes, um, what do you foresee in the future, both with finding um, the fossils themselves as well as uh, the potentiality for identifying them? Um, in some kind of archaeological way. Okay, I'll say straight away I'm not a fossil guy. And uh, there are so many Miocene-Pliocene ape forms, and there's a new Pithecus that comes up every week. So um, I'm not going to be able to say, say much there. What I can say is that um, we spent last summer for the first time not chasing chimpanzees, but actually chasing artifacts. So we were in Kubifora in northern Kenya on the east shore of Lake Turkana working with archaeologists and essentially what we were trying to do is to go back to the pop or to go to deposits that go back before 2.6 look for modified stones on the landscape so this was surface survey and to spot stones which if we saw those in conjunction with chimpanzees we would be able to say immediately that looks like a hammer that looks like an anvil and the idea is that we might be able to spot those in a way that a, an archaeologist with standard training might not, because by and large, archaeologists never go and look at apes, and apes never go out of apes. <laughs> <laughs> never go out and dig up artifacts. So the idea was to bring us together, and that project uh, I think is promising, and and we'll, we're continuing it this year, and the team will now this year go to Brazil to do the same thing with the capuchin monkeys up in northern Brazil. 